It's my turn to talk about uh, the, a little bit about the pediatric orthopedics, which is my business. It's about the technique um, of the proximal femoral osteotomy with a pediatric hip plate. This is a common procedure in our daily routine surgery. So um, for people who deal with pediatric orthopedics, it's a little bit of repetition. And of course, this talk refers a little bit to the uh, hands-on workshop that we do daily here with several groups of you. So if we talk about this oste <coughs> osteotomy, we have to talk about the indications. Where do we need this osteotomy for? So especially in the pediatric orthopedics, the, ma the, the main indication is the idiopathic axial deformity caused by DDH or Coxavera congenica. But also in post-traumatic malaligned or pseudarthrosis, we need this operation to give compression on the fracture gap that won't heal without an additional operation. And of course, in combination with operations like the surgical hip dislocation approach, we can need this osteotomy to improve the containment of the femoral head. So in general, it's an improvement of the containment of the femoral head when we need the proximal femoral osteotomy. Before I go to the operation technique, I want to show you the plate design we have several plates, the varus plate in 100 and 110 degrees, available in 2.7 millimeter size, 3.5 and 5.0. This is the smaller 2.7 plate, which, which has only two shaft screws and only two femoral neck screws due to the smaller size of the uh, pediatric patient. It's mostly in cases for uh, patients under three years of age. You see the direction of the screws, it's two femoral neck screws and one so-called calca screw, and you have the three locking shaft screws. Coming to the valgus plate, which is available in 140 degrees, you have the 3.5 and the 5.0 size, and this has also two femoral neck screws and one calca screws and three shaft screws. Additionally, we have a fracture plate, and this is just used for pediatric or adolescent Femur, proximal femur fractures, and you can use it for just single derotation osteotomies in patients with in-towing or ex -towing, uh, external rotating towing gait. So if you want to plan the osteotomy and the operation and you have the right indication, then the first step is to have a correct and sufficient image. You need an, a good AP pelvis, which is sometimes a little bit difficult, especially in disabled patients, because they are not calm and so you have very often rotated x-rays. Then, in most of the cases, you need a varus osteotomy and you need varus corrections, so you need an abduction internal rotation view. Sometimes you can do an adduction view as well when you need a, varus, a valgus osteotomy. If there's a problem in the rotation, you can also use a done view or a CT scan to see, like in this case, the coxa antitorta or a coxa retrotorta. You have the sufficient images, and then you have to plan your correction. So there are different options to plan the corrections. The first option here is the so-called center-center technique, where the, the angulation of the plate defines your correction. That means if you use a 100-degree plate, you have a post-operative CC angle of 100 degrees. If you use the 110 degrees, you have a 110 degrees post-operative correction angle. The second option, and that which uh, Dr. Slongo mentioned in the, in the workshop as well, is the most used um, planning for the operation. This is the functional planning. And here you compare the preoperative AP view with a done view, and you measure the, the anatomical axis of the femoral shaft and then the anatomical axis in the abduction view where, where there is a sufficient containment of the femoral head, and then you get the right angle of, in this case, 20 degrees, which is your correction angle. The last option is that you use the anatomical planning approach, that you say, okay, you have a retro, coxa retrotorta or, or a massive coxa antitorta, and you plan to derotate to the physiologic uh, antiversion angle of 15 to 20 degrees, so you can just make the operation and use the physiologic correction for the physiologic correction angle. In summary, you can see it here, you have the three options, 
to plan your osteotomy, the center-center technique, the functional planning, and the physiologic correction. And all, in all the cases, and I don't think I have to mention this here, it's, it's, it's crucial to, th to plan or to think about, in the various osteotomy, about the medialization of the femoral shaft, and in the valgus osteotomy of the lateralization of the femoral shaft, because otherwise you change the mechanical axis and you create other problems. So this is something we mentioned in the workshop as well, and there's a special instrument for that, but I won't go in detail here in this talk. You can uh, see this in the workshop. So we have to really take care of the medialization or lateralization of the femoral shaft when performing this osteotomy. Here, a short example for varus correction. You have a coxa valgia of 155 degrees. You, your correction angle is 30 degrees varus. You use a 110 degree varus plate. That means you have to add the 30 degrees to the 110 degree plate, and that gives you a number of 140 degrees, and this is the angulation you have to prepare with your aiming device. And it's vice versa in the valgus correction, so you have to subtract your correction angle that means in this case 140 degrees plate, 40 degrees of correction angle, so you need uh, the preparation of the aiming device with 100 degrees. We start the OR, so the first thing is to pos proper position the patient. You can see it here, and we mentioned this in the workshop, you can use the supine position or you can use the lateral decubitus position. You should use the approach that you're most familiar with, but sometimes due to the size of the patient, it's much better to use the lateral decubitus position. And even if it's a bilateral osteotomy, you have to reposition the patient, but otherwise you will be in trouble with the soft tissue during the operation. And of course, you need a radiolucent table. And uh, sometimes if you do the operation in the supine position, it's good to lift the buttock a little bit because most of the patients, especially in DDH, they have a high or increased antiversion, so we have to come from really posterior to bring the wires in the femoral neck, so it's better to lift the pelvis a little bit up. You see the approach here, as Dr. Slongo said in the, in the workshop, you use a sm we use a small approach, 10 to 15 centimeters, depending on the size of the patient, of course, and then you, use, you detach the vastus lateralis not like in the textbook in an L fashion because the vastus lateralis inserts a little bit more oblique, so you have to uh, recognize this. And of course, we deal with pediatric patients. They have a thick periosteum, so you have to go underneath the periosteum with a respiratorium, and then you can nicely prepare the femoral shaft, as it is shown here on this drawing on the right side in the intraoperative picture, and you see the incision goes subtropicanteric and then 10 <coughs> centimeters to the femoral shaft. The most important step that you have to take care of now is the positioning of the first positioning guide wire. And before you position this guide wire, you have to put a 2.0 K wire on the anterior portion of the femoral neck to judge the antiversion of the, the patient's femoral neck. You check this with the inti image intensifier that the um, K wire on the anterior femoral neck lies in a proper position, and then you can use the prepared aiming block with the wing of the aiming block to position the first K wire into the femoral neck. And here it's crucial really to be on the right position because this is your guide wire, and if this is messed up, the whole operation will go wrong. So you see here, aiming block device, five millimeters to six millimeters down the apophysis of the greater troke. Then you have to be in the AP and in the surgical view in the right position, checked under image intensifier, and then you can drill this wire into the bone. If you want to give extension or flexion correction, you can rotate this wing here anterior or posterior to create whether extension or flexion for your additional correction in this proximal femoral osteotomy. You see here, and you see this picture in the workshop, it's a small incision, so sometimes you have a little bit trouble bringing this aiming block into the wound. Having this guide wire in place, you can drill the 
2.8 millimeter K wires into the femoral neck in the parallel fashion. You have to really make sure that you are in contact with this aiming block, with the bone. Here are two spikes in front of this aiming block and they have to have contact with the bone so that the 2.8 wires are really parallel to the 2.0 guide wire. You check this under image intensifier and you see here the intraoperative picture. It's a little bit bloody, so excuse me for that, but you see that you come really from posterior to anterior to bring the wires into the femoral neck. And of course, let me go back. If you use the 2.7 millimeter plate, you just use instead of the 2.8 millimeter wires, the 2.0 millimeter wires. If you put the 2.8 uh, K wires into the femoral neck, it's a little bit a problem because they have the same length and if you want to approach the second wire into the aiming block, then you come a little bit in conflict with the, with the machine. So there is a special, in the tray there is a special K wire adapter which you can put on the second K wire so you have a little bit more distance with the machine from the first K wire and you can bring this K wire right into the femoral neck without interfering with the other K wire. Then you perform the osteotomy and as we mentioned in the workshop there's also a special device. It's the osteotomy positioner which gives you the right angle or the right distance from the both K wires to the area of the proximal shaft where you should perform the osteotomy. You have to recognize that the more the correction will be the more distal you have to make your osteotomy because otherwise you can't put the calca screw into the bone. Here I wrote down the distance that you should use from the 2.8 wire to the distal femoral shaft according to the plate that you use. And as you can see here, this is not function. As you can see here, for the 2.7 millimeter plate, you just use 9 millimeters. For the 3.5, 18 millimeters. And for the 5.0, 23 millimeters. Then you perform the osteotomy, of course, before you do the total osteotomy, you have to mark the rotation of the bone. You can do this, we show it in the workshop, with two K wires, distal and proximal from the osteotomy, or you can mark it with the oscillating saw. And uh, then you perform the osteotomy. The proximal fragment should be fixed with a bone clamp, which is in the tray of the set also. We call it spania clamp, so that you really have a safe and secure um, mobilization of this fragment. You can see it here, this is the Spania clamp, and you can fix this fragment, then prepare the plate as we show you in the workshop, put the drill sleeves on the plate and then slide the plate with the drill sleeves over the 2.8 uh, K wires. They should come in contact, if you do a right and, and perpendicular osteotomy, it should come in contact with the bone, otherwise you can resect a little bit of the edge here so that you have direct contact with the plate to the bone. Then we have a special um, measure device for the length of the screws. You should pre-drill the 2.8 millimeter K wires approximately 5 millimeters um, under the, under the um, growth plate of the femoral epiphysis so that you stay away from the growth plate there. <coughs> if you use the 5 plate then you have after removal of the K wires to drill with a 4.5 millimeter drill to pre-drill the drill holes for the for the screws. Then of course you have to remove each K wire and put the uh, locking, locking screws inside of the femoral neck as you can see here on this left picture and remember that you leave the guide wire in the bone until you have at least two locking screws in the proximal fragment because otherwise the plate can rotate around the proximal fragment. At the end you pre-drill with a 2.8 drill the hole for the calca screw and then the proximal fragment is fixed. If you have good bone quality you can use the cortex screws to fix the distal fragment to the plate. We use this plate 
a lot of times in disabled and uh, really patients with low bone quality. So we use most of the times the locking screws also in the femoral shaft region. And you shouldn't combine both screws on either side of the, of the osteotomy. If you don't have enough medialization or less medialization, you can use this medialization instrument. We have this in the workshop as well. I won't go in detail here, but you can use this to increase the medialization or to change the angulation of the plate according to the shaft to increase or decrease the various correction that you uh, want to achieve. This is an interoperative picture, a little bit bloody, but uh, you can see here, this is the incision and you come a little bit in trouble with the plate and the small incision for the reduction, but usually it's, 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 it's good possible. You reduce the femoral shaft to the plate, fixes with this Verbrugge clamp, and then you see here you have a nice medialization due to the design of the, of the proximal femur plate. Here you have a small gap due to the varization, and then you fix or you put the um, femoral shaft screw to the bone, and at the end you can put the vastus lateralis over the plate and it's a nice anatomical view that you have and the patient has not much trouble with the soft tissue or with the plate because it's a really anatomical design of the plate. I want to show you three cases here where we use this plate. This is the five-year girl with DDH. The screws will diverge and you have not this nice picture as you see on the other side of the hip. So always check when the OR tech gives you the plate, check if the drill sleeves are correct positioned. This is the last case I want to show you. It's a 15-year-old boy with an externally rotated gait. You see he has no femoral antiversion and he was bothered by that. So they, we planned a derotation osteotomy. You see due to this high CCD angle, you couldn't use just the fracture plate for this correction. So we used the valgus plate for this correction. Six weeks post-operative, you see already callus, and even in the done view. And then one year post-operative, fully consolidated osteotomy, and the patient was happy. So my conclusion for the femoral osteotomy with a pediatric hip plate is that this implant facilitates proximal femoral osteotomy, you need the correct indications. You need a sufficient preoperative planning for this operation. You need to think about the plate design, the angulation and all that stuff. The plate provides stability, so you need no additional fixation with a cast or something. Of course, if you combine it with a pelvic osteotomy, you should use a cast. You have less problems with soft tissue because of the anatomic design. And you usually, as I said before, need no immobilization. We looked, two years ago, we looked our first cases up. It's in 22 patients, 30 hips. We saw sufficient correction in 21 of 22 hips. We had no complication. And the only case that had delayed healing needed additional weight bearing, and then he was totally consolidated. So for our daily routine, we use this SCP plate very often. Thank you very much.